uh, handout? You need one? Anybody else need one? Okay. As you can see, tonight we'll be in Psalm 23. Psalm 23. And I'm sure you all know, but this is one of the most beloved and, and famous, uh, probably the most beloved and famous psalm in the Psalter, but it's possibly the most famous and well-known chapter in the entire Bible. And so we'll try to, to not get a new perspective on it, but we'll try to look at it with, with new eyes, try to get insight into this psalm. And if, as you see on your handout, we are going to be looking at three different roles that we see being played by God and, and by Christ in this psalm. Pri primarily, we think of this psalm as the shepherd psalm. We tend to think of it in, in the lens of the first couple verses, the Lord is my shepherd. And we can actually extend that, that idea of a shepherd to at least verse 4 of, of the six verses, but, but we actually see a shift in, in the roles that are being played. Even if we see, continue to see God as the shepherd until verse 4, we, we see a switch from, from the roles. We, we see specifically, you'll see in your outline, we have the Lord is, is the shepherd, the good shepherd, in verses 1 through 2. And then it switches from, from a shepherd as in somebody who, who provides for his sheep to a guide in verses 3 and 4. And then lastly, it switches to this role of a host in verses 5 and 6. And that's the, the kind of outline that we're going to, to look at. And at the end of the psalm, we'll go through the verses. And at the end of the psalm, we're going to look at how Christ specifically follows and, and completes all of these different roles of shepherd, guide, and host. And just keep those in mind as we read this psalm. So Psalm 23, a psalm of David. See in verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare me a table, you prepare, excuse me, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you for its beauty. We thank you for the wonderful imagery we get in this psalm. We thank you for the, the comfort it is to us to know that the Lord is our guide and our shepherd, the one who makes us to lie down in green pastures and, and leads us beside the still waters, the one who sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. We love you, Lord. We thank you for, for these blessings. We pray that we would see this psalm anew tonight, that we would see this psalm and, and get some, some new truths out of this for our lives as, as we examine it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't really have a date for this psalm by way of introduction. We don't have a, a specific any sort of front matter that tells us when it was written specifically. But I like to take the view that it was written by an older David, not, not David in the sheepfold, but an older David who is looking back on his life and realizes throughout his years that God has been his shepherd and is reminded of his, his young days as a shepherd himself and sees the analogy of God in his life uh, acting as a shepherd. And John Calvin seems to take this view as, as well. And I think that it's, it's supported by the fact that we see in the last few verses that David says, uh, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Uh, you anoint my head with oil. Uh, some have said this, this isn't kingly imagery, but it kind of reminds us of that. It kind of reminds us of, of a kingly banquet. And I don't want to say that it is, but, but it kind of looks that way. And as well, David describes that he, he has enemies his, his uh, God has prepared him a table in the midst of his enemies, and that's not something we would really especially think of in, in David's earlier life. That's, that's a, a category of his later life. He had many enemies, and yet God preserved him amidst those enemies. So it seems to be uh, written by a, an older David. But let's just, let's just dive into the verses 
uh, verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And this is a very, again, we, we, this is a beloved psalm. We all probably could recite it by heart. And so this is an image that we kind of take for granted. But, but what does it really mean that, that the Lord is our shepherd? Well, uh, we think of it as a beautiful thing. Of course, it's, it's, it's beautiful for us. And, and one reason that this psalm is so famous is, is because of that beautiful imagery. We think of, of grassy and, and green pastures. We think of ourselves uh, as these sheep who, who are, who are uh, in, this, in this gentle landscape. And we have no fear because we know that the good shepherd is near. The good shepherd will, will guard us against en- any enemies. He will guide us into provision. And that's beautiful imagery. But, but Charles Spurgeon actually points out that there is great condescension in this idea of God being our shepherd. Because shepherding was not a luxurious job. It was not a sort of occupation that was looked upon highly. It's not that it was, well, it it could have been looked upon in in a derogatory sense. In fact, uh, here's a quote. I found this article from a a, a modern sheep farmer. His name is is Craig Roberts. And I think that this, this, this little passage puts into perspective the, the condescension of God in saying that he is our shepherd. Let's listen to this. From the beginning of time, shepherds have been the proverbial ditch diggers, the downtrodden, the disrespected. From the shepherds of the hills of Scotland to the shepherds of the new western frontier, all have been discriminated upon and viewed as a lowly class over the ages. Even today, many wish not to be referred to as shepherds, but instead as ranchers, landowners, or flock owners. The work of shepherding is left to the lowly or immigrant shepherds. Shepherds have typically been the transient or migratory workforce since the early days of agriculture. Shepherds have never been romanticized like the western cowboy. In fact, the shepherd has often been cast as the villain, the migratory farmer who was ruining the cattle grazing land of the west. And so we see that the shepherd is not an exalted position. It's actually one that's looked down upon in the world of agriculture throughout the ages. And this claim is actually vindicated by Scripture. We won't turn there. But if you look on your own time at Genesis 46 and verses 33 through 34, when Joseph was bringing his brothers and his family into the land of Egypt, and he was going to introduce them to Pharaoh, uh, we see that, that the shepherds were an abomination to the Egyptians. And so we see that, that this is not a highly looked upon job. In fact, that many times it was the case that the youngest one in the family, the youngest son, would be the one who looks after the sheep. And we know in that culture, there was much priority given to the eldest son. He had the birthright. He had all these different things. And so uh, we see that, that giving this job to the lower son means it's a sort of a low position. It's not, not really an exalted idea. But, but all this to say... The, the Lord is our shepherd, we, we need to remember that this is, is a great condescension on God's part. That he is stooping down to us to guide us in, in the paths of righteousness, to guide us and protect us. He is stooping down to help us. And it also, it should give us a sense of humility. Because if you know anything about sheep, you know that they're not very smart. And so when we, we see this picture, we see God painted as this wise and brave shepherd, and we see us painted as the sheep. So it should give us a, a great love for God that he's willing to stoop to us, and a great humility in ourselves that we are painted in this light by scripture. And uh, it's not just that the ancient Near Eastern idea of shepherding causes us to, to, to realize, again, the condescension of God, but we see in, look at verse 3. It says, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And the idea of restoring there is literally the, the idea of, of bringing back. And so the picture there is when we go astray, God brings us back. And we know that this is not something that would be required if the fall of mankind had not happened. And so God condescends to bring us back to himself, even though he created us in such a way that we could walk perfectly before him. Yet after we fell, he still stoops to to help us and to aid us and to bring us back to his uh, paths of righteousness. And so we see, the, the, again, the, the stooping of God, the humility of ourselves, and the great love that God has for us in being our shepherd. We see in the, the end of verse 1, I shall not want. And in verse 2, we begin to see the implications of that, of us not wanting. What does that mean? It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside the still waters. We see that with Christ as our shepherd, we, we have everything that we need. We, we want for nothing. We see that it says that God causes us to lie down in green pastures. And the idea here is that these pastures are, are rich in grass. They're, they're green, delicious uh, pastures of, of great grass. And some have suggested that this, this term in, in Hebrew actually means young and tender grass. You know how sometimes the, the, the sun will bake grass and it will get hard and, and you'll walk on it in your bare feet and, and it's sharp and it kind of hurts your feet. But the idea here is that uh, it could be young grass, n- a newly sprouted grass that's, that's very tender. And so it's very easy to eat for the sheep. It's, it's very comfortable to lie down in. And another picture we have is the idea of abundance. See these green pastures. And when, when God causes us to lie down in this pasture, the idea is we are so provided for, there is so much abundance that we can lie down and rest in this abundance. We, we can lie down and it's all around us. The idea that I kind of got when I read that is, is if you watch one of those old cartoons and you see Daffy Duck jumping into a, a vault of gold and swimming around in the gold, we see there's so much abundance that he's, he's swimming around in there. And that, that's kind of what the idea is here. Is there's, there's so much abundance that, that you can lie down in it. We also see the picture of still water. Sheep tend to be afraid of running water because the noise scares them. And I found this interesting that, that sheep will drink running water if they have to. They just don't, they don't like it. They, they're, it frightens them. They're scared of it, and it puts them in danger. And so we see that when, when God leads us to still water, it, it shows his care for us. It shows his gentle with, gentleness with us, that, that he cares how, how we feel, that he cares uh, uh, for us, that he, that he has great, he knows us well, and then he cares for us. He's not a careless shepherd, uh, because again, he could have brought us to, to running waters, but instead he, he gives us uh, things that uh, do not frighten us. He, he, he gives us provisions that, that, are, that are suited to us. We read verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I remind you here, we still kind of see this idea of the shepherd, but now the role switches from provider to a guide. We see Christ as a guide in these verses. And again, the first thing we see that God does is he restores our soul. And if you remember a few moments ago, I said this means that he brings us back. He restores us to himself when we've gone astray. It also says that... um, and this is, excuse me, this is, this is most or, or very applicable when, when God first converts us. He brings us back to himself from our wicked ways. He, he brings us from strain uh, to, to back to himself. And actually one translation of the, the Latin Vulgate renders this passage that uh, he converts my, or excuse me, he hath converted my soul. So we see that when Christ first converts us, Uh, He is restoring us. He's bringing us back. But also, every time we go astray after that, any time in the Christian life we sin, we we fall out of uh, walk with God, he continues to bring us back, not just one time in conversion, but all throughout our lives. We also see that he leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I found it interesting, uh, this phrase, paths of righteousness, the the, the word path literally literally means ruts. Like if a wagon went through mud, it, it's those kind of tracks. It's, it's like tracks of righteousness. And the picture that that suggests to me is, and I don't want to read into this too much, but, but it seems that it's denoting that the paths of righteousness are not hard to follow. There's clear paths in, in the ground that are, are led for, uh, for, that are made for us to follow. And yet, in this, we see that the, the law is not, is not a difficult thing to understand. It, God's standards for us are very clear. And yet, God still offers us assist, assistance in following these ways. He still leads us in these paths of righteousness. So we see again God's care for us. We move on to verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And this is certainly one of the most comforting verses in this psalm, we see that even when we pass through the valley of the shadow of death, yet God does not leave us. I remember I watched a TV show, and I don't remember what 
show it was, I, I was a long time ago, but something that was said in the show stuck with me. It was two people, two men talking to each other. One of them said, uh, I, it's so sad that some people have to die alone. He meant having to die without any loved ones around you, dying in a hospital or, or in your house or whatever. And the other man said to him, well, we really all die alone. And from an atheistic perspective, that, that seems to be true. Even if we're surrounded by loved ones and friends and family on our deathbed, yet we still go into that darkness all by ourselves. Even if we commit a Romeo and Juliet and we and our beloved die at the exact same time, yet we still walk into that darkness all alone. When, we, when our eyes close, we don't see the other person. I mean, that's from a humanistic perspective, but... From a Christian perspective, we know that even in death, God holds our hand. That's very comforting to us. We know that that in death, we are not alone. I love this quote by Augustine. You live in, he's talking, speaking to God, you live in my heart through faith. You are with me now to ensure that when this shadow of death has passed away, I may be with you. So God holds our hand in death, and he brings us to himself. And we get this phrase, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. And this, was, this is the phrase that makes me think that the shepherd idea is still going on, at least this far. And there are several ideas we can take from this, this, this idea that thy rod and thy staff comfort me. For, for one, they symbolize protection. These are the instruments that, God would u- that the shepherd would use to protect the sheep. And so we see that there is security in God's sheepfold. But it also has the idea of, again, uh, bringing the sheep back of disciplining them when they go astray. And we see that David is not begrudging God's rebukes. David is not uh, grudging that God disciplines him when he goes astray, but he says that it is comforting to him. And I think that it is comforting that when we go astray, God does not allow us to leave him. If we are truly converted, God will bring us back. Even if we sin, if we fall into unbelief or or something of that sort, God will bring us back to himself. And it may be, it may be hard, it may be with the rod and the staff, it may uh, hurt for a while, but, but ultimately him bringing us back to himself is a great blessing. And finally in verse 5, we switch to this role of, of a host. Christ is our, our great host. We read verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And we see that in the presence of his enemies, a banquet is prepared for the psalmist. And, of course, as we stand in the psalmist's shoes, we can say the same thing. And the implication here, I think, is God is protecting him. Even though his enemies stand around him, even though he seems to, to be threatened by his enemies still, yet God prepares him a table before, before his enemies. No matter how angry his enemies may be about it, no matter how uh, upset his peace may, may make them, the peace of his heart and the peace of his mind in Christ, yet it is still remains. His peace still remains. It cannot be bothered by his enemies. We see also this, this picture of not just provision by God, not just provision for our basic needs, but also abundant provision. You see, there, there is a, a table set before me like a banquet. He, he anoints David's heads with oil, and he says his, his cup is running over. So he has abundant provision as well. And in verse 6, we see, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And literally, the picture that is being painted here is, Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me. It's like the Lord's goodness and mercy is chasing after him. Like no matter where he goes, he cannot escape from God's goodness. This reminds me of of another great psalm, Psalm 139 and verse 8. I'm sure you're familiar with this. If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. So Even if we wanted to escape from God's goodness, we couldn't. We, there's nowhere we could go as, as, if we are truly believing that is, is separated from the Lord's goodness. Lastly, we see that David will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the idea here is not so much From what I saw, it's not so much staying in the house of the Lord forever, but it's returning back. It's it's continually coming back to the house of the Lord, returning to the house of the Lord for the rest of his days. He will continue to return to the Lord's holy temple. 
So we've seen the verses in this chapter. Now I want to look at specifically how Christ Jesus specifically performs these three roles of shepherd and guide and host. And you'll see that I've written some, some scripture on the handout that you were given. First of all, we see that that Christ fulfills the role of shepherd in several ways. And we see these ways described, I think this is John 10. I don't actually have it on my my paper, but I think it's John 10. It says, starting at the top, "I I am the door. If anyone, and this is Christ speaking, of course, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. In this first section in your handout, we can actually see two different ways in which Christ fulfills the role of a shepherd. And the first one is is kind of different because he says, I am the door. He uses this different analogy of a door. But then he says, uh, he who, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. We see this idea in Psalm 23 of the Lord guiding his people into green pastures and still waters. And here we see Christ claiming that for himself. He says, I am the one who guides my people to green pastures. Then we see that he also lays down his life for the sheep. He uses this analogy of a hireling or a day laborer, someone who does not, uh, who is not in the family, someone who does not have any sort of stake in the sheep, but somebody who is hired just to take care of them for a certain amount of time. This kind of person, if if any danger sprung up, if a wolf or a lion came, he would not protect the sheep. He would just run away because he, he... These sheep do not belong to him, so there's no reason that he would stay and and risk his life to protect them. And this analogy, if we were to to do a study in John, we would see that this analogy is specifically speaking of the scribes and the Pharisees. It's not talking about true gospel ministers, but it's talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, because really, they were a sort of day laborer. They only shepherded Israel, Israel because... They wanted uh, power and glory and to be honored and to be rich and all these different things. And they didn't really care about the good of the sheep. And we see that this is true when Christ comes, that they are opposed to him because they're afraid of losing their own power. And so they don't, when any danger comes to their their office, they run away from it. They they run away from the good and they lead the people towards evil because they, they are being threatened by this. We see that Christ is different. Christ did not hesitate at the suffering. We know that Christ laid down his life for his sheep. Christ ultimately and and truly cared about his sheep. And so even in the face of of death and suffering and the feeling of separation from the Father, Christ still embraced this so that he might save his people. He is the one who lays down his life for the sheep. He defends them to the death. And we see uh, continuing in this first first scripture in, in the handout in verse 14 in the middle of the paragraph. He continues, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. We see the third way that Christ fulfills this role of a shepherd is that he knows his own sheep. I'm sure that that some of you have have heard of, or you can look it up on YouTube, seen uh, video clips of shepherds calling their sheep and, and and you can see, uh, I watched one today where uh, a couple people came up and tried to call the sheep and they wouldn't come. But then the shepherd, the true shepherd, came up and called the sheep and they all came to him. And that's because uh, he knew the sheep and the sheep knew him. We often hear politicians trying to, I guess, market themselves as the champion of the little guy. They will do uh, publicity stunts or, or publicity ads or whatever to, to get to paint themselves in such a light that they know uh, their, their voter base, that they're intimately connected with them. We know that this is all just strategic marketing. We know that, that our politicians, most of the time, they don't know us personally. They don't really know who we are, especially the, the higher up you go, the more true that is. But, but almost in this, this, I'm not sure if it's irony, but, but in this glorious truth, we know that, that the God who transcends all of the earthly leaders, he knows us intimately. 
He knows every hair on our head. He knows everything about us. He knows what we like to eat, what we like to drink. He knows what we, what, what we like, what we don't like. He knows everything about us. He knows us. And we know that because he has revealed himself to us, we know him. And in, in verse 16, again in your handout, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. And so, fourthly, we see that Christ gathers his sheep as a shepherd. He performs the role of a shepherd by bringing his sheep into one flock. And we see he did this in his earthly ministry by gathering the faithful remnant of Israel. But then we also see that that after his resurrection, he continued to call his sheep from the Gentiles. He continued to bring his elect from from the, the four winds. He continues to bring his people into his church. And so he gathers as a shepherd his sheep. So that's the four ways in which Christ fulfills the role of a shepherd, but how does Christ fulfill the role of a guide? I didn't include it in the handout, but I think it's worth noting, uh, we're going to see here that, that Christ promised that he would send the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and that he would guide his people into all truth. But we know that this is not a, a new thing. We know that, that the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets of the Old Testament who, who wrote down the scriptures. And if you want to write this down and look it up later, you can see in 1 Peter 1.11 that, that Peter writes that the prophets prophesied under the influence of the Spirit of Christ. And so all throughout the, the, the history, all throughout redemptive history, Christ's Holy Spirit has, has inspired his people. But we see here in the second paragraph of the uh, handout, it, it says, I still have many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And this is important. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. And so we see that, that Christ speaks through his spirit. And we also know that, that Christ spoke through his Holy Spirit and inspired his prophets to write down the scriptures. And so now that we have the, the completed canon, uh, Christ, of course, speaks to us through his spirit, but also in his scriptures. That's why we need to be careful about relying too much on, on feelings and whims and, and those sorts of things. We know that the Holy Spirit is within us, but he has inspired the word of God. And so we want to, when we are thinking about what, how we want to live our lives and what we want to do in life and these sort of things, uh, we need to look at the scriptures and rely on the, the Spirit's interpretation of that. And so we see that, that, that Christ guides us by his Spirit. And lastly, we see that Christ provides for us as a host, uh, both now and in heaven. And you'll see two scripture references. The first one is from John 6, and this describes how God is our host even now in, in this life, how God prepares uh, abundant uh, blessings for us even in this life. We see the first reference. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and this is Christ again speaking to the Jews, <clears throat> and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. We see that the spiritual food which Christ has provided us with is his own body. In sacrificing himself on the cross and by allowing us to be partakers in the sacrifice, he, he, he nourishes us spiritually. He gives us eternal life through this spiritual food. And of course, we know that, that this is uh, best pictured in the Lord's table. We see us, us feasting upon uh, the body of Christ and, and, of course, we know that we don't believe in, in Roman Catholic uh, transubstantiation, but we know that this is a picture of Christ's sacrifice. We know it's a remembrance for us, and we know that, that we do receive uh, spiritual nourishment for our souls through this sacrament. And lastly, we know that Christ will forever be our host in the new creation. In that last scripture reference, it says, he who, this is from Revelation, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And of course, this is a picture of Christ giving us eternal life. This picture of, of feasting upon the, the tree of life is the picture of everlasting life that we'll have in the new creation. So let me just make 
quick application here. What, what can we do? What, what should we do based upon this psalm? What's the call to action tonight? Well, first, we want to rely upon Christ's provision. We see that Christ gives us all of our needs. He, he, he gives us spiritual food. He leads us into green pastures besides still waters. He gives us everything that we need. We know that he also gives us in abundance. He sets a table before us. He anoints our heads with oil. He, he causes our cup to run over. And so I know it's hard, and, and, and it's easy to say when, when life is going good, but, but we should rely upon Christ. Even when times get hard, we should rely that he is going to take care of us. Second, we should stay faithful in the means of grace. We should continually be reading the word, continually be in prayer, continually be coming to church and, and, and looking for God's spiritual nourishment in these means of grace. Because if we are discouraged, if we, if we say we're, we're upset about this or that, and we feel that, that God is not answering us, sometimes we find it's because that we are not in the Word. We are not coming to church as we should be. And I'm not saying that it's always that way. I'm not saying that's always the case, but sometimes it can help to, to even double down in these means of grace to really be in communion with God, again, through the word, and and especially through prayer. Third, we should look forward to the day when Christ will be our host in heaven. We know that Christ provides for us here on earth, but we know that that all these these things that we have here below are are just uh, shadows and and do not compare to the blessings that we will have in heaven. Because then we will have eternal life. Our bodies will not break down or grow old. We will live forever in the presence of, of the triune God. And lastly, we should thank the Father for giving us his Son as our shepherd, as our, as our host, as our guide, who, who leads us through the, the, the realm below, who holds our hand in death, and who uh, leads us into green pasture. I hope you've gotten something new, a new appreciation for this psalm tonight. Uh, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this psalm. We thank you for the beautiful imagery, Lord, the be- beautiful poetry. But even more, we thank you for the beautiful truths that it conveys, the truths that Christ has condescended to be our shepherd, that we can rely upon him to to lead us into green pastures, to lead us beside the still waters. But we know that he is able to, because when he claimed that, that he is the good shepherd, we know that he was claiming to be God, because only God is the good shepherd. Only God is the ultimate shepherd. We know that that your son is powerful enough to take care of us as his sheep. Pray that you would bless us with this word, that we would take something home tonight and meditate upon it throughout the week, that it would nourish us until we come back on Sunday. Pray for the prayer time to follow. We pray that you'd hear all our requests. We ask all these things in the name of our good shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen. Does anybody need a prayer sheet?